Um, hello everyone, um, firstly apologies for keeping you waiting, um, on the program. Um, it will all be worth, worth um, our meeting delay starting off. Um, my name is Ross Keane, I'm the director of the IFI and you're all very welcome here today for the first of two panel discussions that we're running here this weekend as part of Spotlight, um, the IFI's focus on new Irish film that has been running throughout the month of April. Um, we're delighted to be working in partnership with Boards Gone on the Air and the Irish Film Board. Um, I want to say a big thank you to um, James Hickey, Theresa McGrain and Louise Ryan for their support of Spotlight running throughout this month. So thank you very much to them and also to the Arts Council who support everything that we do here at the IFI. Um, Spotlight has been running, as I say, throughout the, the month of, of April and it's sort of been very timely for us. We, since the start of this year, we've been um, sort of working on a new IFI strategy that we plan to publish um, this June. We've been, as part of that, the process has been that we've been meeting and talking with various different people and consulting with various different people. That includes sort of our audiences and the people who come in here and regularly engage with what we do. And um, we've also been meeting and talking with the IFI Council, which is made up of about 150 people who work in or are connected to the Irish <coughs> film industry. And we've also been meeting with our various partners and stakeholders. Um, from all of those conversations, two sort of occurring trends or themes started to emerge. One of them was about critical discussion and people sort of feeling that one of the most important things about the IFI and the work that we do is, is having a place and a home for discussion about film and to encourage critical discussion and debate and conversation about film was a key thing for, for people that we spoke with. And the second aspect was Irish film and the importance for the Irish Film Institute to be presenting Irish film on a regular basis, which is something that we do all of the time through the work of Sineva and everyone in the Irish Film Programming Department here at the IFI. So today is sort of a great opportunity to bring those two things together, have a critical discussion and a debate about Irish film. So it's sort of been very timely with all of those conversations. Um, we're sort of nearing the, the final stage, really, of the whole consultation period that we've been running, but I'd just like to sort of throw it out there again to people that if anyone has any comments or suggestions or ideas that they'd like to feed into the, the strategy consultation sort of period, um, I'm always sort of willing to hear and open to hear different ideas and suggestions. All of my details are on our website, so please, if there are anything that you want to, to sort of suggest or ideas that you have, please feel free to send them on to me or to talk to me about them. I'd love to, to hear those ideas. So back to today, um, this first panel discussion will be chaired by Dr. Diogo O'Connell from IADT and author of, um, oh, I'm actually forgetting the book. New Irish Storytellers. storytellers um, st uh, narrative Strategies in Film. Sorry, Diogo. <laughs> a momentary lapse of, of memory. So I'm going to hand you over to Diogo, who's going to introduce then the rest of today's panel and, um, and get the proceedings underway. Thank you very much. Okay, thanks, Ross. <laughs> Okay, welcome everybody. It's great to be here to, uh, with such esteemed directors to talk about Irish film. Um, our directors span, I suppose, 25 years of Irish film with uh, Jim's first film, My Left Foot, 1987. More than 25 years. Does that mean I'm um, the oldest man in the And then, yeah, I'm afraid so. Um, 89. Up to Kieran, who launched Jump last night, and um, Mark's film. Um, uh, King of the Travellers, which is out at the moment. So we really have um, a great range of um, films to draw on from our um, five directors. So I'll give you a brief introduction to each and um, then I think we're going to screen a short promo and then we can start our discussion. So starting with Mark at the far end of the table. Uh, Mark studied film at Ballyfermot Senior College and the New York Film Academy before he made his debut directing a film called Between the Canals. Um, last year at the Galway Film Fla, he launched um, King of the Travellers, which is out at the moment, which many of you have probably seen, and an experimental feature called Stalker. And at the same time, he launched a manifesto for Irish film, declaring that, I hope you don't mind me quoting, um, the conventional and the generic Irish films of the past oh, no. have been no. <laughs> by what could be referred to as an Irish new wave and unquote. And I think it's a, it's a good statement because there is an awful lot happening right now and maybe we could see it as a new phase and we might discuss that um, and also locate it historically over that past 20, 25 years of what has happened um, to, to, to get us to this point. Um, and as I said, his film King of the Travellers went on national release um, last week. 
Kieran J. Walsh studied fine art at the Institute of Art Design Dun uh, in Dunleary and then went on to do an MA in film at the Royal College of Art in London. And he's worked in film and television drama for many years. Um, among his credits include When Brendan Met Trudy from 2000, Watermelon from 2003, and just last night launched, am I right, in, here in the IFI, his film Jump. Um, his television drama credits include Raw, and Hell for Leather, which was part of the Two Lives series, and he's directed numer numerous short films. Karma Winters was born in Cork and studied drama and English at Trinity College. Um, her debut feature film was called Snap in 2010, which many of you have probably seen, uh, which she wrote and directed. And um, it was premiered at the Tribeca Film Festival in New York and went on to win the prestigious Variety Critics Award at the Karlovy Very International Film Festival in the Czech Republic. Um, B for Baby, her first full length play, was produced by the Abbey Theatre as part of the 2010 Dublin Fil Theatre Festival. And her new play, Best Man, is going to premiere at the Cork Midsummer's Festival and later on in Dublin. Um, next we have Jim Sheridan, who is a six-time Academy Award nominee and is best known for many films, um, among them My Left Foot, In the Name of the Father, The Field and In America, as well as <coughs> Some Other Son, where he's a writing credit, The Boxer, Get Rich or Dying, Brothers and Dreamhouse. He has won numerous awards, including Oscars, Golden Globes, Golden Bears for Best Director and Best Original Screenplay on a number of those productions. And here we have Juanita Wilson, who is an Irish writer and director from Dublin. Her short film, The Door, received an IFTA award in, 19, in 2009 and an Academy Award nomination in 2010. Her debut feature film, As If I Am Not There, set in Bosnia during the Balkans War in 1992, received the 2011 IFTA <coughs> award for Best Film, Best Script and Best Director. So we have a wonderful panel here today, as I said at the start, that spans a huge range of Irish film, telling stories in many different ways, working in many different areas of film production, Indigenous <coughs> Irish production, as well as Hollywood uh, feature filmmaking. So there's lots of um, uh, material there to uh, get insights on from our perspective and um, look forward to hearing what our directors have to say. The, the plan for this afternoon is to show a short promo and then ask each of the directors to uh, address one or two questions specifically on Irish film and uh, then we'll get the discussion going and later on we'll throw it open to the floor and <coughs> we'll be invited to ask questions. So a big round of applause for our panel and we'll see you. I'll never forget the first moment when I walked into a cinema. I was hooked from there on. Achievements, adventures, funny stories, not so funny stories. I said a bad word three times. And these people out here. Oh, <laughs> savage. <laughs> I think someone is looking for her bedtime story. I'm only having a bit of fun, like, dominating by it. What I want to do is stay out of trouble. There comes a time in life when secrets should be told. I'm a good girl, sister. 
one day, if you want it, we'll give you a life far away from this. I only hope this already went for you, far as it worth it. Jesus and Matthew, you really got into your shocking holy thing. So it's war. It's never gonna go easy for us. It's a hard love. Not a lot of people understand. Believe me, boys. It's for your own good. We will march peacefully this Sunday, and march, and march again. Just missing this whole bloody country. I feel I've missed out. Yes, little little. In the bad fair. We do this together. You come here, and you fill his head full of crazy dreams. Time comes, you have to be behind the old Hellraiser man. Take some responsibility for your life. He knew you had life. <laughs> you will be judged by love. By love alone. Did it ever occur to you there might be more than one alternative? Well, the things that might have been, should have been. start by maybe throwing out the discussion in tweet, it, um, the program will end there by talking about telling Irish stories. I wonder could I ask um, the panel what they think um, about Irish film currently but in, in a broader sphere of film either in the context of European cinema or more further afield. How do you see your own work um, situated? Um, and well, Does anybody want to start or will I Pinpoint. <laughs> Jim. <No. laughs> Juanita, go on, please. Juanita? Um, these kind of questions are always scary, to say the least, because um, I don't, I mean, I, I don't know. I mean, I think any story that an Irish person tells is an Irish story in many ways, and some stories that other people who aren't Irish tell also are Irish stories, but are they Irish films? Who knows and does it really matter at the end of the day? I think, I think what we have managed to do um, with a lot of our films is tell personal stories in intimate ways or, or new ways. And I think of Once, and I think of Kisses, and obviously My Left Foot. And you know, I think um, the stories that we just concentrate on characters and what they're trying to do, um, they seem to really connect on a world scale. scale and, uh, that's always really heartening. So I think when we when we really tell stories that we care about ourselves, I think they seem to translate whether they're stories of struggle or injustice or achievement or dreams or you know I think that that when we keep them quite personal, um, they seem to to translate even though they are intrinsically Irish. In in terms of my own work, briefly, yeah. obviously the door was um, shot in Kiev, and um, so. I don't know where to place that film because it was shot in Kiev and it didn't get into any of the um, European festivals and then a year later turned up um, in Hollywood at the Academy Awards. So I don't know what that means um, and my own work I guess would be seen to be more art house but yet it doesn't quite, it's, it's more populist I think than art house so, and, and yet it's not as mainstream as American a lot of American stories, so I think I fall bang slap in the middle somewhere between it all. Um, and I guess I'm kind of happy to be there. Okay, okay. Jim, do you want to come in? Yeah, I don't really know what to say. I can say anything. Um, Irish, Irish. Where are we now in Irish film 20 years on? 
Have we, you know, um, are we part of a broader culture now, do you think, of, of European cinema or world cinema, or are we still very much identified as, as Irish cinema? I think when Edith's right about the intimate little stories that we, when we tell those, they seem to work, but we don't seem to uh, really tell visual stories, I don't think. I think we tell kind of, um, you know, like face based stories. You know, when I watch that promo, it's like, I'll just see like loads of actors. I don't see so many images, and I think we're still, you know, caught in a kind of verbal culture. Um, it's kind of weird, even though, you know, we don't. You know, we don't speak Irish, so we speak English. So we're like caught in a kind of trap of still addressing through a language that we don't own. Does that sound crazy? Mm. I know what you're saying. <laughs> huh? Well, I well, yeah, Carmen. Um, I was thinking in events of this panel, I thought, well, what were the films that stood out for me over the last 20 years? Of course, I'm too young to really answer that question. <laughs> but. Um, <laughs> in babyhood, let's say. Um, one of the ones that was in my list, I'll pick two. One was um, I Could Read the Sky, and the other was In the Name of the Father. They were seemingly opposite ends of the spectrum. Um, I saw I Could Read the Sky here in the IFI, and I was speechless after. It was a purely visually told story. Extraordinary. It was a film emanating from the world of dream the unconscious logic of images rather than language. I've never been as impacted by something in the hours after it. I couldn't reach for language. It was such a deeply visceral experience. And it did engage with the common tropes, immigration, the Irish immigrants experience. It was, uh, so it was very familiar terrain. Now it, they had cast a novelist, not an actor, Dermot Healy. Mm -hmm. And it was a face film as well, but it went through from the face into landscape, face, landscape. And you really felt that there was a psychology in the landscape that matched the psychology in the, in the, in the Irish person that belonged to that landscape and then was extradited from that landscape. The other film then that was in my list in terms of seemingly on the other, now I don't think that remained quite a private film. I don't think it was, it opened out to a collective national experience in the way that In the Name of the Father did. I saw In the Name of the Father quite a long while after it had come out and been such a huge event. I was lying in a bed in California with four other people, <laughs> fully dressed, I hasten to add, <laughs> fully dressed, and we popped it in the DVD player. We all had a huge Californian-sized glass of wine. I had a massive red, um, glass of red wine in hand. And I was watching it like this, and I was sipping my wine, and I felt something clanking against my teeth as I was watching it, but I was too engrossed to pay attention to what it was until the lights came up, we switched on the light. After the film, and I saw a massive cockroach dyed red from the red wine, and I had drank all the wine around it, but I hadn't consumed him. And my sense in watching, I'll never forget the feeling of watching that film in California, because in a way, you know, in terms of Ireland, and a lot of our cinema engaging with the national question and who we are as a nation, a new nation and all this. And there I am over in California, in a way escaping it, escaping my own national identity. And I'm there with, you know, a one first, second generation Irish person and then Americans. And I watch this film and I'm suddenly shake. All my cells are agitated by this film that's absolutely demanding that I respond to my own history and its place in the present. That I've, I've walked out of, I feel like I've suddenly riveted by, um, and my history's caught up with me in California. And I mean, I think, if you don't mind me saying, I mean, you know, whatever, but I think sometimes as a storyteller, what's going on in society, your, your job as a storyteller is to be a lightning conductor. And you know, you're not operating in isolation from your environment, but there's a timeliness of when you can tell those stories. And to me, the time, the proximity to that story seemed perfect. 
we seemed ready to be able to review or something. But I know that for me personally, watching it, the distance was such that I felt, you know, it's a bit like, you know, in Irish history, you, you can bring a lot of people to the crossroads and you can rouse the masses, but what for? What next? What then? Well, the film kind of asked me that question very strongly. What now? This as, what's the inheritance for me as a storyteller? What responsibilities do I have? To my tribe, really. I'm not, in, I mean, I'm not telling my own story. That's the place, that's the diary. And those two films capture very much, I suppose, almost two ends of the narrative spectrum of Irish film from you know, a, a mainstream classical telling of, of a story to a very experimental work, which was based on photographs as well. Interesting. Yeah, it was based on the book, which yeah. was a, a little narrative and, a, and an image, and a, nar- yeah. a little narrative and an image. But in fact, they had a huge amount in common. Yeah. I mean, a profound exploration of... of the people in a place and, and what happens to people in a place and an experience like what you were saying Manita, about a, a, an experience of people emigration or you know injustice and that brought to bear on on the narrative form but in very different ways yeah. um kieran have you in your recent film um jump your current film um, I read a tagline saying Derry like it's never been seen before and very much it's kind of post ceasefire, post conflict Derry and telling a, a, again a, um, a, a film that has, um, I suppose, you know, could travel anywhere in the world and be, be received. How would you respond to it where, where you see Irish film now within the broader context? Uh, <clears throat> well, I think, um, I think that uh, internationally, um, it's, I'm always curious to find out what, what, what people internationally think about when you mention Irish cinema. Mm. And the fact of the matter is that most of them don't really realise that there is Irish cinema. Um, mm. They think there's, there are some Irish films that they know, but the idea of Irish cinema, as a, as a, like French cinema, for example, or, or German cinema from the 70s, or whatever it might be, they don't really have an idea about that. They just know films that they've seen. And the ones <laughs> that seem to have uh, <coughs> put... Um, Ireland on the map cinematically. I mean, we all know that The Quiet Man did, did, did that, and, uh, and that was a particular kind of Ireland. But then, uh, I think the first time... I was living in London, uh, and The Commitments was released. And for the first time, we saw Dublin, and a, and a re- relatively realistic Dublin <coughs> portrayed on the screen. Um, and then the, the other two Barrytown films, uh, you know, The Snapper and the Van, and all of a sudden, uh, it was just like, People knew about Dublin, like, you know. People knew about this place called Dublin, where they like to sing, and you know, they just have this joie de vivre and the spirit, and uh, and and a lively, family-orientated kind of uh, uh, stories. Um, and uh, it was almost like a calling card. You could always reference, you know, as soon as you said, where, where, they said, "Where are you from?" I said, "From Dublin." Oh, the commitments is great. It's the first thing they'd say, you know. Or, um, um, but with regard to Jump, I mean, Jump is a, is, is a film set in Derry, and um, why I was very interested in trying to make Jump and portray Derry on screen in a new way uh, was because every time the word Derry is mentioned, or London Derry, depending on your persuasion, uh, the first thing that seems to come to people's heads is Bloody Sunday. And there have been a number of films made, uh, actually not shot in Derry, but made uh, set in Derry about Bloody Sunday. And... Um, I think it's kind of unfair that they have to have that shackle around their neck for the whole of their lives because actually there's a whole scene going on up in Derry and in Northern Ireland that has nothing to do with the Troubles at all. In fact, even when the Troubles was going on, there was a vibrant culture. Uh, even if you look at Good Vibrations, for example, I mean, rock and roll was strong and Terry Hooley did his bit to try and uh, quell the difference between Catholics and Protestants. But, you know, uh, so that's what I was interested in. Um, uh, and uh, I think that's why the film has actually managed to play uh, at festivals internationally quite successfully. And it was shown a couple of times, once in Germany with no subtitles, and uh, I thought that we that were dead in the water, but people just didn't matter what they were saying because they understood the story, you know, visually, actually. They, yeah, that and was the it. narrative on the way. Was, yeah. Okay. Yeah, and it's interesting uh, what you're saying, because it's picking up a point, I think, that Carmel mentioned about the right time to tell a story. And during the Troubles... This wasn't the time to tell the story, just like, you know, a lot of um, 
films based on Northern Ireland now are comedies, whereas 20 years ago, that wouldn't have been the right time to mm. set, you know... I think uh, there's permission to laugh now. Ab- yeah. Exactly, and also to, you know, look at, you know, stories and settings in a, in a different light. And I also think it's important that it's not, a, it's not like I'm ignoring what happened, yeah. you know, because there's been some great films and it's very important what happened in Northern Ireland, but... You know, uh, in a way, and, and in fact, um, there's a, a shot in the film that we go to three times, which is your, that gable end wall, which says, you're now entering Free Dairy. Um, but our characters just drive past it, you know. Um, it's there, and they're not going to forget about it, but they move on, and they're heading off somewhere looking for the heart of Saturday night, you know. Uh, and so it's not, it's, it's not like an elephant in the room. It's just that, uh, you know, there is another side to life up there than that, you know. Okay, and we might come back to that in terms of audience as well, and um, Juanita's films, which raises lots of interesting questions about audience. Mark, would you like to comment yeah, or well, come well, in on this yeah, question first? Um, no, I, I think personally uh, that there's a major shift going on in Irish film uh, over the last couple of years, you know, and I think that, as I said before, like uh, that, I think um, filmmakers and Irish cinema is finally find its voice, and this is not to go against the films in the past, like you know when. Just a little story, I, I was living in the Bronx and I was working in furniture removal for two years and uh, I had a, a collection of Irish film and music, you know, uh, but I had like In the Name of the Father, My Left Foot and, and I had um, the van and, you know, all kind of old scratch DVDs I'd follow around and I'd be showing people that I lived with, you know, really proud like this is, you know, but, and I was just so passionate about it and um, but I got friendly with this uh, Brazilian guy, well, he got friendly with me, he was a bit strange, and, uh, <laughs> and uh, he goes, he said to me one day, like, um, I, can, I can get into films, like, I can get, for, get free into, into, into premieres, so I said, right, 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 so, so I went along with him, and he was a, he was a, he was, he was a, a one of a group of kind of stalkers that were going around, like, in New York, you know, and uh, they'd, they'd get into premieres, like, sneak in, or just find a way to, to get through the door. But one time he said to me, we were working like on a truck in the Bronx or something, and he said, uh, oh, this uh, Jim Sheridan's film is, uh, is premiering tonight. And I was like, what? Jim Sheridan's film? And he's like, yeah, it's called In America. So I says, um, I'm gone. <laughs> so we snuck into Jim's film. And this is like, this is like back, because I was saving money to get to the New York Film Academy. For two years I was working furniture removal, and I had a big wad of cash under my bed this much, you know, and uh, trying to save up enough. And um, but I went along and I got in and I was talking to Jim and Paddy Constantine were there and I was a bit drunk and I was like taking bits of food and like J- J- Jim was very friendly though. But, um, <laughs> uh, but no, my point is like the, the old traditional storytelling techniques of film, I don't feel like they're getting made these days. And that's kind of a pity, like, you know, you look at films like uh, In the Name of the Father, My Left Foot, they're absolutely classic, you know, classic Irish films. and. I think it's a combination of just a brilliant story or a book or a brilliant script, you know, mixed with a brilliant director who can get an amazing performance and a visionary, you know, and the way music is used, like, you know, in, in the name of the father when Daniel Day Lewis comes back from England and arrives back in Belfast and uh, he walks around the corner in his fur coat and the Kings comes on, like, you know, does visionary things, but I think that I think it was quite rare because there was only Jim and Neil for, and the earlier guys, Joe Comerford, was experimental. But I feel recently, in the last couple of years, with um, with the new kind of you know wave of, of Irish film directors, I think that we're taking more risks, and I think that's really important. Um, and I hope that continues, you know, mm-hmm. um, because I feel like a lot of the great cinema, you know, like in France. Uh, French people, half the people, half the films that people go to are French cinema, you know. And, and, and ha- whereas here, there's a big problem with Irish cinema. People aren't going to watch Irish films, you know. Like, and they're not making their money back, you know. They're making like even really good films like Savage, Good Vibrations. These films are making like fifty grand. They're never going to make their money back unless you get a big hit at the box office, and that's very rare, like the guard. So what are we doing? Are we trying to make our money back? <clears throat> or are we going to try to build something really personal, something visionary, something new? You know, and when you do find something new, you, if, you, if you go down this route of, of finally finding your voice, because I feel personally from my work, I feel like I'm only starting to find my voice. I feel like a beginner because Between the Canals was 
you know, doing what I did in my short films, casting non-actors, and then King of the Travelers, I felt that I had to do that. I had to cast non-actors because it, for the community, I had to cast real travelers. But then with Stalker, I kind of developed something and I went that direction. I took a lot of risks because I didn't have the pressure. And um, I think if you go down a way and take those risks, it can lead you onto something else and you find suddenly like a, a, a valley, you know? Uh, and I think that if you, if you see a lot of the new wave, like the, the, the British new wave and the 60s and the French new wave and Italian neorealists, that's what they did, mm. and uh, the cinema culture was born out of that, mm. you know. And, uh, and they, they they did that 50, 60 years ago when we were just censoring films. So it was yeah. only in but the, the last is, 30 years that we've had opportunities. To yeah, exactly. Films. But I do think there is room for both. I think mm. there's room for the traditional story, like with a, with a great book or a great script, you know, and there's also room for, for that, you know, personal uh, vision style of filmmaking. And I think, yeah. Well, you mentioned Joe Comerford, and I just I, only a few weeks ago I saw Traveller that Neil Jordan wrote and he directed. And I was absolutely stunned because I thought that's exactly the film that if it came out now it would be lauded as absolutely new and radical and revolutionary in its storytelling. And I said and it happened then. So I think the notion of what's new is a little bit misleading. I think the word needs a bit of examination. I don't really believe, I think the more, it's what, in terms of, I think the, the dichotomy is more between the conditions in which films are made, whether it's a studio picture or an independent picture, which is subjected to completely different pressures. But I suppose what I think, I mean, I remember when I saw Between the Canals, I got, re I pricked up my ears the minute I encountered performances and words issuing from those actors, non-actors, well, there were, the actor, there were actors as well, but um, just stories coming from a place that hadn't made it onto the screen. I mean, my passion is for let's get the stories that are out there with incredible riches, just get them onto the screen. Now, I think whether the, the storytelling is radical or classical is kind of secondary because your form will be... In, will be um, that's to do with how does this story need to be told. It's not really to do with you as an artist deciding, you know. I, I think the story will demand to be told a certain way if you're listening to it closely enough. Would you enough. say that was the case with your own film, which well, is told in a very interesting Well, it's interesting because the first pe thing people say about Snap is it's unorthodox structure and uh, people across the board, you know. And actually, what I, re what I, what I did was tell it from an emotional chronology which is true, true to how people live their lives. We're going through time it seems from A to Z but internally, emotionally, spiritually actually our past and our present are, are like a jigsaw puzzle all mixed up. So in fact all I did was I went deep into the character um, as played by Ashley O'Sullivan and um, I went through the generations of a family and I told the story from an emotional chronology instead of um, a, a linear time-based sequence. So it was actually quite, it made a great deal of sense to me. It allowed me then to actually avoid some of the jadedness of A plus B equals C grammar, which just for me personally as a writer, I don't get sufficiently excited about to liberate my own unexpectedness, we'll say. You know, I'm trying to keep myself on the edge of my seat in order to keep the audience on the edge of their seat. Like, and if, I'm, if, if there's a bit of boredom creeping in, you know, well, mm, that's not a good, not a good sign. Yeah, that's point. brilliant. <laughs> no, that's very brilliant what you said. I think you should, like, run the whole area. You're the best talker. Because <laughs> I think the emotion, the logic of jigsaw emotion, that is, strikes me as a great you know a great way of thinking about things because that's in our dna isn't it mm, yeah you know like the stories that we carry inside of ourselves have nothing to do you're right with logic and they're all to do with emotions that are buried or are not mm -hmm. and uh sometimes you just have to you know you just have to put the story or the anger out for to be seen, you know what I mean? Mm. I think kind of, that's what I remember 
the thing I remember most about in the, in the name of the father was doing the uh, ADR, you know, in London, and we had all these girls from the north, and they had to go, fuck the Brits, you know, for like an hour. <laughs> <laughs> I swear to God, it was the fucking wildest experience I was ever in. At the end of it, I felt like we, we had a party after. <laughs> It was so powerful as a an hour in in a room, you know, because everybody just let out, you know, because they were in England, kind of expressing something that couldn't be expressed, mm -hmm. and it was very powerful. I think, like, I don't want to drag the I, I probably the person to drag the conversation down, so you probably shouldn't talk to me. Well, don't worry. We'll no, like I just feel. <laughs> On one hand, I feel that, you know, Kieran's right about the troubles and the fucking getting caught up in, but the history of 500 years in Ireland is the history of Catholicism and Protestantism. That's the history. With a little bit of odd Jews thrown in here and there, but the history is essentially that spiritual divide. And I think... I think in terms of cinema a lot in that way, you know, just personally. I think in terms of community versus personal responsibility. Mm -hmm. And m movies, they just respond to personal responsibility. They respond to the Protestant ethic much more than they respond to the Catholic one. Um, and it's very hard for our stories to be seen in England, it's it, like I know you're talking about seeing those ones, and but but that's in it. There's a there's a, a resistance to seeing that story, you know. Um, so I find that you kind of have to appeal more. To, like you're right, you know. Like your movie suddenly pops in America, you know. That can happen because because people. You know, they don't want to see it in England. And it, somebody, you said about France and cinema. Look, Maggie Thatcher, right? Okay, forget the politics. The reason English cinema kind of died was she, Ronnie Reagan rang her and said, take that tariff off American films, right? So no reporters can report this, but, but I say, put the fucking tariff back on. <laughs> That's the cinemas that survive are the cinemas that are protected against the machine, which is Hollywood. That's Korea, that's France, that's Taiwan, very select countries. The machine will kill everything. And now the machine is killing independent American cinema. So where, where do, does that leave then a, a cinema as small as Ireland then? Are we to... It's, like he says, you know, you, you do a genius Irish movie and it does 25,000. Look, Neil's movie, I saw it here downstairs, The Crime Game. And I was like, hmm, great film. Like, <laughs> don't care. And I'm like, will this work? I don't know. And then Harvey Weinstein gets it, puts it out in America, it does 65 million. Harvey gets Neil to sign the deal. You know, you're not getting any money, basically, is the deal. Uh, he puts it out, it makes 65 million, they come back, it makes 25 in England. It had done zero. So movies only exist in the commercial framework if they are accepted by the American population. And if that doesn't happen, everybody thinks they're going to a failed movie. Now, the same thing happened with, with Once. Yeah. I think it was released here and nobody went to see it. Yeah. And then picked up at Sundance and it made 10 million at the box office in America. Yeah. And then I think it was re-released here and people went to see yeah. it. Yeah. Well, the story that Martina would tell you, the producer of the film, is how much is, was spent to keep it in the cinemas until it could become a hit. So yeah. there was a massive amount of money spent before it brought in anything in America, and, and, uh, in America mm -hmm. which is really key because it's a bit like you play a tune often enough on the radio, it will be a hit. Now, um, now when, when, for instance, and I love that film, by the way, and I think it's very cannily a revisiting 
of like the familiar story with a flipped relationship within it. It's very familiar territory carried beautifully by those songs. But like what I find interesting is that when you look, when I was in England, I was at a distributors talk. So I'm sitting there amongst distributors talking amongst themselves and they were talking about the top 100 films at the British box office. There was one film in there made for 100,000, but that had 2 million spent on it in marketing before it could do anything. What was so, that? Um, I don't know. I don't it's know. Good, it's <laughs> Ill, Ill, Ill manners. No, no. It was, it was after London to Brighton, but it was in the same scheme, but I hadn't seen it. Mm-hmm. And it was saying, like, basically, you know, there's a decision on what's going to become a hit as well. You know, that they'll just... I don't mean to be cynical, but I'm thinking, actually, for us as filmmakers, I think it's interesting that the Irish Film Board have, have noted that first features tend to do well, and second features tend to dip. Now, I think there's something very revealing in that, and that is... Uh-huh. You get out of the filmmaker's way, actually, on a first feature, more often than not. The storytelling is very true. There are often, like, our errors are survivable. Mm. Our mistakes are survivable. What's not survivable is there's 20 people in a room and all trying to tell a completely different story. And often a first film is actually, actually the story gets told, despite its flaws. Yeah. You know, yeah. like, actually, when I think of my favourite <laughs> novel of all time, the last third doesn't work at all. It's irrelevant what happened to me in reading that book. Mm. In the first two thirds, it doesn't matter whether the third at the end worked or not. What was that? Um, Anne Michael's Fugitive Pieces, which became a film. I'll never forget it. And that's what I think we need to, like Beckett said about a visual artist when he was talking about their work, he said, to be an artist is to fail as no one else dares fail. We cannot eliminate risk mm. from art mm. and from storytelling. Now, you know, we just can't. And the minute we try and do that, we, like, we muzzle the storyteller. I, I wonder if we, if we looked, we looked towards America and the distribution and the control of the market and the huge budgets that go into that and not into production. What if we look the other way to Europe? What's your experiences of other European countries? Are they doing something rice that we could learn from, like when he's Okay, European. Kinsale in 1798, forget Europe. <laughs> the history is, we are the people who the Europeans will come to too late. <laughs> That's the history. And keep looking at the history, it keeps repeating itself. Is that crazy? At the same time, everybody here, I'm sure, has engaged as co-producers with different European countries. Just yeah, but, then, but is the narrative of Europe, like, right now, narr- Europe's playing a narrative, and that narrative is, it's not really working out, is it? The narrative of Europe? Well, well it's, it's really like, it's not, not a federal a society, yeah. it's just a, I, it's just a group of countries with Germany, yeah. you know, well, dominating it, you know? Clearly that is... The, the big issue and what we should be, well, not what we should be talking about, but just to keep it back on film, um, I'm really okay. interested in, say, to maybe discussing a little bit more about, you know, when you're writing a film and visualising it, like, are you visualising it for, for a specific audience? Like, we talked about themes and we tend to define Irish film, maybe in, in a narrow way, but now if we look back over the past 20 years, you know, well over 200 films have been produced and when you look up close at them there is a, an eclectic range of different types of stories themes etc so um i'm curious about your experiences Juanita when you um you chose subject matter that clearly wasn't irish yet the themes must have resonated with irish audiences um, because they're you know what you're saying about you know suffering injustice etc what was your experience abroad with those films and here with those films. Yeah, I think um, what was very heartening really is um, with both the door and as if that no matter where they played in the world, the response you know was was always very heartfelt. You know, I guess the people who choose to come and see those kind of stories are open and and engaged. And uh, it didn't really matter what language and what country you were in, what language was spoken. And sometimes again, like Kieran saying, they might not have the subtitles right, but people responded regardless and that's that's very very heartening i have to say that that stories can touch people regardless of language or cultural background 
for me, I think the personal, the hardest, well, it wasn't really a hard choice, but I had to grapple with the language issue because both films weren't in my own language, obviously, which is still not really my own language. <laughs> but um, they were in neither Irish or English. Um, so making that decision as to not put them into English um, immediately um, defines and restricts your audience, your potential audience. And with The Door, definitely that was um, never a question with as if it was always my intention to do it um, in, in, in its, its, its local languages, language, but there was a moment when um, there was a little bit of interest from America only if it would be in English. And you do have to question, you know, if I want this story to go out there and people to engage with it and to get the maximum audience so people are aware of the story, um, by not setting it in English, I'm going to restrict that. And is that my responsibility as a filmmaker? Is it to get it out to as wide an audience as possible? Or is it to, to protect its authenticity by putting it in its local language? And, you know, it's, it's a hard question. I don't think there's a right answer. I know for me, uh, I couldn't, just couldn't have them, you know, speaking English. It just yeah. didn't ring true. Yeah. But then you're faced with a subtitled oh. film, so you're going to have very narrow distribution and things like that. So I guess the thing is you have choices that you have to make yeah. along the way, and all those choices will have consequences. And just to be sure that you know what the consequences are when you're making that choice, and that the choice then is really coming from the heart for that project. But I don't, you know, mm. it, those are the hard mm -hmm. questions, I think, at the end of the day. Yeah, it's a very good point. Sorry. Right? No, just a little point. No, I actually have that. Uh, problem as well, but it's the reverse of it. It's uh, the film's been too Irish, and um, you know, like using Irish music, and um, I felt that there hadn't Irish traditional music hadn't been used enough in Irish film, and so I was experimenting on shorts, and I made this short thirty-minute kind of gangster film called Dubs, thinking will traditional Irish music work? You know, I, I didn't mean like Kaylee music or score, it's just actual songs like, you know, the pose. Like, so I used Christy Moore over some tunes and the Dubliners, and, and uh, there was one scene in dubs where they're burying a lot of the Wicklow Mountains, and the, the, the guys dancing around to Don't Forget Your Shovel if you want to go to work. <laughs> and I just realised, geez, that works, like, you know. So that's what I used then for my voice, was in between the canals, I used. Uh, you know, all Irish music and the, the Dubliners and Cato Reardon and Damien Dempsey and then I developed and then in, with King of the Travellers I, I used the same again and um, was all traveling musicians like Pecker Dunn and Margaret Barry um, and the Furies and, and then for Stock again. So that would be m up until now but I think it does restrict you uh, and also in terms of festivals and getting the film out there um, I think when you make a film with actors, non-actors especially, that have very strong accents. I, I don't know if it travels too well, because uh, it's harder for them to understand, you know? And, um, um, I think the, the irony of the situation is, if, uh, if, our, if Irish cinema was made in Irish, Gaelic, like Irish, uh, as opposed to English, they would probably fare a lot better internationally, because they would be marketed as strictly arthouse films, and Whereas we are competing with other English language films, which is America basically, you know, uh, and to a lesser extent Australia and Canada and the UK. Um, and that's the irony of the situation. Mm. I, look, uh, I have a simple thing if I'm trying to make a movie work in America. For the first 10 minutes, don't let anybody talk. <laughs> <laughs> like, just shut up. Because they just go, what are they saying? <laughs> like when we did it, my left foot. I'll give you a, a particular example of my cowardice. Um, Harry Weinstein came to me and said, "You fucking Daniel, fucking, you, I, I can't hear, can't understand everything you say." So, okay. so he had like a list of ten or twelve lines that they couldn't understand Daniel saying, you know, and. This was a huge thing when we were making the movie because everybody was going like, we can't understand anything he's saying, all the other actors and the producers. And so I, I was like, oh, because I knew Daniel and I knew he'd go, mm -hmm. <laughs> And I knew he wouldn't do it, you know? And so I was thinking, oh, what 
do I say to Daniel, you know? Because he's just going to take me head off if I go in like a little whore. And uh, so I went to the pictures, you know, I went to the cinema. I sat behind the audience. And whenever they said, the girl friend said to the boyfriend or vice versa, what did he say? I just wrote it down. And I came out with 48 lines. And I went to Daniel and said, listen, this is what the audience can't understand. He said, who gave you that list? I said, nobody. I just went to the teachers and watched. <laughs> and it was funny because I wasn't then delivered in Harvey's sermon, you know. Daniel did most of it. But it's very interesting just... Because it's sound and vision, if, if they don't get the sound, they'll... You know, they pull out. Mm -hmm. So, and I didn't mean to jump on you about the European thing. That was just, Europe is like a Babel, Tower of Babel with 20 different languages. And everybody talks about subtitles, but like subtitles in America just don't fly anymore. And that's simply because of the VCR, the videotape. Before the videotape, there was a communal experience in colleges of going to European films, and basically there were films with sex in them, mm -hmm. right? That's what the European film was. Mm -hmm. When the college circuit broke down because of the VCR, because everybody said, oh no, you can get that on tape, they stopped going. So the, the, the technology can kill you mm -hmm. for a little bit of time, you know? So I'm just very interested in creating I, and I just, I keep saying this and I, I never get anywhere. You talk about two million spent on a movie. Germany spent 400 million making movies in the 90s and early 2000s and zero distributing. Mm -hmm. <laughs> like, that's Europe. You know, it's like, there's not actually a communication taking place on a deep level. And so if, if you ask me, like, you're saying about the English language. I say, okay, everybody should speak English. Let's make that a rule in the world. <laughs> no, I mean, like, think about it. Is it wrong that everybody communicates? So, like, on a certain level, what's happening is the logic of communication as opposed to art. Communication becomes art when you're dead. You know, you don't know till later whether it's art. Right now, it's just about communication, isn't it? It's about communicating, getting your story, feeling a response. No, Carl, well, one, you, you kill me. <laughs> <laughs> well, yesterday, I just said this to Ashley O'Sullivan outside the door, and a mathematician was talking about maths. And he said, maths shouldn't be used for anything practical. They sh maths shouldn't be applied. Maths is just beautiful. It's absolutely pure. And they were saying, well, what's beauty? And he went, I'll think about that and I'll give you an answer. Wow. And he went away and he came back and he said, beauty is four things. Significance, unexpectedness, inevitability, and economy. Now, I was thinking... I I, I was wondering, I was just thinking. Never met that girl. Hmm? Go on. <laughs> what is beauty? I'm thinking, well, I don't know about communication becoming art when you're dead. I don't know about that. I mean, I think it's, I've never engaged with that idea before, but I, I think. Um, but what I mean is, don't worry about the art, just communicate. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. Connect, make the connection. Mm -hmm. Um, but I suppose the one thing I value about art, because I often think, Jesus, I'd rather if it was a, pro a choice between spending the money on the spire or in, you know, actually making sure no one was homeless in Dublin. I'm going, I'd be, I wouldn't be spend. I love the spire, by the way. I adore it. I wouldn't spend it on it. Like, you know, I'd be questioning our values. But I do think the one thing that art does do is hold the contradictions of our human experience in a poetic wholeness. Otherwise, those con contradictions, if we didn't have a way of holding them, holding them, we'd be absolutely mad. There's a possibility of being absolutely mad. Yeah. 
So I'm kind of, uh, you know, I, I ask myself, like, sure, is what I do remotely useful as a storyteller? Like, am I wasting public money when I get a small little scrap of public money? Am I wasting it? But I, kind, I have to come back to, well, we can't imagine a world without story because the need to tell the story is so inbuilt, it's so irrepressible. And I do see that if you look at Truth and Reconciliation, what they did, they let people tell their story. So, um, and I, I'm just kind of wrong about when you were talking about Europe, I do think for us, as, well, for me as an individual storyteller, I was very excited by Denmark. And it was just, I don't know what it was really, Denmark, but what it, was, it was just a couple of people, and it was in particular probably Winterberg and Lars von Trier to a, a, a lesser extent. But do you know, I think as regards, they had a so-called manifesto, which is comparable to us pretending, like essentially that was a marketing tool. They were tongue-in-cheek and they were creative artists, so they got playful, they got involved in... The, the press's need to have a banner to organise experience and people. So at the moment, like when I was going around with Snap, people were going, oh, do we have Irish female directors? And you go like, uh, well, do you know, there is, that's, it's a kind of a nonsense, obviously, in the same way as the new wave. To be, to be honest now, even though I love that you mentioned me in your manifesto, <laughs> like, like I love it, but I don't believe in it, of course, really. But, and I think, but, yeah. but, but, when the when you have something like the new wave or like dogma or whatever you know i think it's a way of people externalizing thoughts and like listening to all these directors i'm going like you know i never hear american directors talking like we're talking or i never i don't hear anybody talking the way this panel is talking you know and it feels to me that things would improve a lot if there was a, maybe not a dogma, but a, a way of engaging with, with the, you know, with the, what you're talking about, the narrative, the meaning of what we're trying to do, because you can, yeah. you can I'm trying to fucking yeah. figure out where that cockroach is. I reckon, <laughs> but you know what I reckon, I kind of, I'm, I'm really interested in what you were saying, and I think what they did do creatively as artists, they didn't become abject about their condition as artists and actually you're in a very odd position you're in a position of great power and utter powerlessness as an artist in a society you're the lowest of the low with a projected glamour you know to be honest it's an incredibly contradictory experience any actor will tell you the same writer actually you're living in a very liminal space where you're utterly you're not taken remotely serious uh, seriously as an adult in this society and on, on the other level um, you're the kind of blank screen onto which people project all the dreams they ever had you know and imagine you happily living so you're in an impossible position but I think as a group when artists get together and kind of claim a bit of terrain and a bit of ground are just uh, some set some parameters even if they're permeable because they broke they broke every single rule in the dogma every film that was ever made within dogma broke dogma rules and that's important. If they were actually, if they had set up a set of precepts to imprison themselves in, it would have been a disaster. But in fact, they gave what they gave. Well, they gave other people a handle to speak about their work. Mm. Okay, Mark, do you want to um, Yeah, no, I just feel sometimes that I wish I was in something else as maybe a musician, because <laughs> musicians have this opportunity to develop a voice. You know, um, like if you see. Examples in Irish musicians would be uh, someone like Van Morrison or uh, Damien Dempsey, and they've taken these all these things that they grew up with, like Van Morrison grew up with all the blues and so on. Damien Dempsey grew up with reggae and hip hop, and they made it their own with their own, and then the, the Dublin slant on us, you know. And I think that um, you know, with these guys at like Vinterberg and stuff, they were they were finding their voice through film, you know, and they had the opportunity uh, to find their voice. But it's difficult when you have a budget, you know, mm. because you have to make something and it has to be for an audience, you know, and you want, mm. you don't want to let people down. So the bigger it gets, the wider the committee, the wider the, vo the people you have to please. And um, But then again, the, the examples of big budget films that are great, is, there's lots of them as well, like Jim's films are amazing and they've got, you know, they're, they're big films and they're great stories. So, um, but in terms of finding find the voice, I think it's very important, like, the only the thing for me that the most important thing 
uh, as an artist or even just as a, like someone who just wants to express things is risk, 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 just that, you mm -hmm. know, mm -hmm. just try different things and, and you develop something different f from that, yeah. Yeah, like I think there's two things been mentioned here. There's the idea of a manifesto which can mobilise energies at a particular time and people can subscribe to it or not and work within their their art form that way. And then there's what you're talking about as so well, the history of European cinema where there were key moments like Italian neorealism and French New Wave and they get identified after the event when we look back and saw something had happened at that moment generally in response mm -hmm. to mm -hmm. political situations or a <coughs> historical moment. So there's you know, two things that work. I wonder if we look back over the 20 years, and after this question, we'll throw it out to the audience, because I'm sure people are dying to get in. Um, like, is there anything happening right now? If you look back over the past few weeks and the past couple of years, there's some very interesting articles surfacing. So is there something happening now? Or were there other times do we look back to the 70s? You mentioned Joe Comerford's Travellers, for example, or the 80s, or you know the early 90s. Is there? Can anyone think of a time, a key marker, I suppose, in the, our recent history yeah. that taps into something? What you're what you're saying? The problem, yeah, prob you know, I think uh, maybe there was a flutter of films that were finally um, not uh, locked down by the constraints of. Um, the church, um, the burgeoning alcohol problem in this country, mm -hmm. um, uh, the history with the British, um, and that was around uh, around the year two thousand or just before. Um, and there was a, there was a flutter of films that were like I'm just thinking of like About Adam, for example, um, Man About Dog, when Brendan yeah. Metrudy, that were kind of, and it was during that horrible Celtic Tiger, start of the Celtic Tiger period, you know, and uh, I think there was a kind of a, a, um, a willingness just to tell a different kind of story. Yeah. That's probably, I mean, I, I can't think other than that, mm -hmm. if there has been any kind of... Yeah, I think in a way, uh, what we have at the moment, um, which creates a richness, is we have diversity, mm. possibly, you know, more diversity than ever before in terms of budget, styles, mm. Um, you know, audience access, all of that kind of thing, and I just hope that that is a direction we keep going in, and not try and define or lock down or who's in and who's out and who's new and who's old and who's you know, like keep keep everything open as possible, and particularly um, to new people getting opportunities. I think that's something we have to absolutely always um, rigorously um, adhere to: is that people have access, whether through schemes or whether through encouragement, whether through mentoring, whether through whatever it is, that people, everybody gets a chance if they want to um, to try and to, to use that voice, to create that voice. And I think that really is probably our biggest responsibility, is to keep things as open as possible, rather than... I would crush every one of them if they were to take money <laughs> off me. <Yeah. laughs> I want the money. I don't want to give it to anybody else. No, but I think no. that's what's been so exciting, is suddenly a film appears. You know nothing about it, you know nothing about the filmmaker, and suddenly this amazing film has been made below the radar, and it's fantastic. You know, along with then maybe a very established filmmaker might the next week bring out a great film that you know mm. um, works in mainstream America. So I think I think um, diversity is really is very important. And and is that more likely now than twenty years ago, or is it possibly we've less? more more we've more courses, which mm. is good, but also beyond you don't need to do a course either to start making films. You know, I think. Mm. It's acceptable that you just go and do it or you try and find any means possible. And, um, Does technology good. help or hinder? Yeah. Just talking about um, traditional music before, but I think like, you know, if you go back to the, to the 80s and stuff, there was so many amazing Irish musicians, traditional music scene, you know, the, the Fiori's and the Dubliners and the, and the Pogues, and the Pogues were creating this new sound, you know? And I, and I felt, felt like it was kind of an emergence and they were all working together and they were all kind of, you know, in sync. and. And, uh, but now it's just died off. There's no traditional Irish music, and I don't mean like I mean it didn't develop. You know, but myself and my wife uh, live in Peru, and the traditional music from the mountains has kind of come into the city and it's formed this amazing kind of rich culture because there's so many musicians, there's thousands of, of them. Whereas here we just had, you know, a select number of Irish traditional musicians, and now there's. The only one I can think of is Damien Dempsey, who's still doing something in that way, like, you know, um, um, and that's kind of, if you relate it to film, I think 
I think I feel like now is the time when we have all these, you know, we have the old and the middle and the young, and they're all coming up, and they're all creating something that's really unique. Here's right you now. know here's the thing you know uh, you were talking about dreams and stuff like. And everybody always goes on like that, you know, like the dream and the artist, and they have a dream. What if the audience are living in a dream? Mm-hmm. What if they don't know what the F they think? Mm-hmm. You know, like, they live in a narrative that's total bullshit. Mm-hmm. And I'll give you an example of that. Like, I, for me, you're now entering Free Dairy. It has a huge iconographic importance because... When there were civil rights marches, just take that narrative now, and take Roddy Doyle and were the blacks of Europe and all this, which I don't believe, but it's a good sentence, you know, to describe something. But so the narrative is we're having a civil rights march, right? But civil rights are an amendment to a bill of rights. You have to have a bill of rights to have civil rights marches. Yet all these people are walking in civil rights marches, getting battered on the head for it. And it's a fantasy. It's a non-existent possibility. They should be walking for a bill of rights. They should be saying, we want to be American. We want to be in a constitutional society. But they're not doing that because they're watching the telly and they're seeing Martin Luther King and America. And they're going, oh, that's us. We all live in America. In our heads now, it's all American. All TV is American. All movies, that's where most of the people live. In a false narrative. When I say false narrative, I mean just an, an enclosed narrative. You know, that's just coming from the machine. Yeah. And I think all our discussions are great and that, but someday somebody has to fight the machine. Mm-hmm. Someday somebody yeah. has to fight the machine. Guantanamo. Mm-hmm. Disgusting. Drones. Disgusting. Okay. Mm-hmm. So, I, I really so, so. Yeah. I think what makes me go is rage. Mm-hmm. I don't know where that comes from. Yeah. But I do know that it's the one thing, that the expression of it is healthy and the repression of it Mm. is the Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Mm-hmm. As regards a new wave, I suspect it hasn't happened yet. That would be my Mm -hmm. gut feeling. I'm groping inside myself to respond to how people are nowadays receiving their stories and making their stories. It's not really on the screen is where it's all happening, it's on the internet. Um, and the reality TV phenomenon isn't going away. Mm. And it's affecting how people view. It's, it's, and I think that generation, like I'm looking at some of my they've been actually using a camera on themselves. They've been looking. My step-grandchild, my partner's grandchild, is now making films of him at two years of age, is reviewing his experience while it's happening. Mm. Now, if you grow him when he's mm. 20, he's not going to tell stories in the way we've told them. We use technology. Technology is using that generation. Like, this is a m- big figure of eight that's going on. I'm groping in myself to find the news. I haven't found, I know honestly in myself, even with my last few films that I've written now, I haven't found a form that will respond to that experience yet. And I know it's a new form, mm. and it isn't them first new clothes. I don't really think, I don't think um, Snap was a new way of telling a story, it was just a way of telling mm. a story. But I do think there is, I feel in myself, you know, the people like the, the being John Malkovich and all them, they're all on the edge of, and I, it relates profoundly to what Jim is saying about where reality is situated. Like, is that a fantasy? Like, the audience is more <laughs> obsession. But if you, take, if you take, like, Van Gogh, Van Gogh, whatever, mm-hmm. here's a guy with, like, half an ear or something, like, or mm-hmm. somebody tries to cut off his ear or cut out the sound, right? Mm-hmm. And he's spiritual, the son of a spirit, a, a pastor. Mm-hmm. And he goes out into the graveyard and his name is on the tombstone. So, as a child, he, he's making up for... Like, 
his dead Vincent brother. So he's like, I know Vincent's loved, so if I'm dead, I'll be loved. Mm -hmm. And then, parallel to that, he's trying to get the woman to look at him, even if she's a prostitute with a torn eye and syphilis. Mm -hmm. He's like, look at me. Mm -hmm. He's trying to get attention, he's trying to get vision, spirit. And when he gets that, when he's in ecstasy, he's suicidal. Now, everybody in the world understands this picture. Everybody, he's our favorite artist. But that's a real hard place to go. Mm -hmm. Ecstasy and suicide. <laughs> but kind of, like you're saying, that's the obligation of an artist to be in those territories, to be in the far out territories in the... Yeah. 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 Um. I'm conscious of time and the discussion is really interesting, but I want to involve the audience a little bit. So um, we'll throw it out there and can I just see, just get an idea of how many people do want to come in and we'll try my, okay, so we've got four hands up and I saw yours first. So. Thank you. Uh, two, two points, one uh, in connection with what Jim was saying. Uh, about 10 years ago, the Hungarian director, Isfan Zabo was here in Dublin. And he was talking about the fact that uh, across Europe, the top box office in every city was American. And that he said, the reason we love to go to American movies is because the Americans make films about winners. And we, when we think of the number of people that we've killed in Europe in the last hundred years, mm -hmm. we tend to make films that are much more introspective and uh, basically, we prefer to go and see films about winners, and that's why they're top of the box office across our, our countries. The other point was to do with uh, what Kieran alluded to. Uh, if the French don't make movies in French, nobody will. If the Swedes don't make movies in Swedish, nobody will. So their governments have to be very, very protective about their film industries. And what we have to do is to get our government here to be as protective about our film industry. The Irish film do, do wonderful work, but there could be more. There could be much more. Okay, does anybody want to respond? That there's not a specific question there, but I, I, I it's think, raising think, issues. Yeah, the, this business about going to, to American films, uh, whether they're about winners or not, I think, you know, your average 15 to 25 year old who goes into the cinema sometimes doesn't know what they're going to go to see until they go. So they're going to the cinema and then they go in and they look around at the pictures and they, and, and they probably look and they've got like a tenor in their pocket and they go, they see a big American film uh, which things are being blown up. Like how many things can I see that are going to get blown up for 10, 10 right, euros? Yeah. That's good value, like, you know, you're going to go and see, yeah, like, yeah, $250 value, million yeah. dollars worth of exploding yeah, things yeah, on the screen. I'm, there's my money. But the blow ups win in the end. Yeah. <laughs> but the, the, the actual truth is there's no film industry. There's a TV. And what's succeeding is what you can advertise on the TV for 30 seconds. That's, that's the basis of it. All American cinema is about what can we put on the ad for 30 seconds to drive people out of their homes, which is hard to do. Mm -hmm. You know, because now there's so much, I can get any movie on Netflix. I don't have to go and see the stupid Irish movie down the road, you know what I mean? <laughs> like, it'll be on Netflix next week. Yeah. But we haven't found a way, because the, the industry was all, is all about 250 million people, Europe has 50, Germany has 80, you know, France 50, Italy 50. There's nobody can compete with the 250. And so the whole industry has been created around catering to that audience and then exporting it. It's a colonized situation. We're in colonies in terms of ideas, images, and America is now the dominant culture and we're the colonized. That's the way, and maybe I'm just too Irish, but that's the way I see it. Yeah. But interestingly, there's more screens now than ever before, so there's more opportunities. I know it's controlled and there's probably less choice, but there is more opportunities. So who, who's, in, whose in responsibility ways, is it to push that diversity forward? I think in many ways there may be more films being made, but more films then not being seen as well. Mm. 
I mean, the, 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 I think the real revolution has to happen on the end of the pro process. Like, uh, our access to, I actually think it'll kill us as human beings Which? to not get representations of ourselves. Yeah that we can uh, deeply resonate with, that will actually return us to ourselves when we become dispersed in false imagery. Like, I, I think it's life or death. I actually mm -hmm. feel so strongly about it. And if I'm writing something that isn't life or death, well, then I don't need to write it at all. I, don't, I, I actually feel that's my role. Okay. And but do you, think, mm. do you think that... Look, I, when Jesus says, this is my body, this is my blood, right? Mm -hmm. That's a magic act, mm -hmm. right? Mm -hmm. It's like a game. It's like, this bread is my body, this wine is my blood. It's a fucking narrative. Yeah. So he's putting out a civilized narrative. It's a brilliant gig. It'll be remembered for thousands of years. It'll be played every Sunday. Yeah, but it's not either or. It's not whether it was real or magic it's both and it's both oh, vibrating it's both. i agree with you it's both but yeah. the both is like the, the, the narrative he's hiding is the interesting narrative to me which is sacrifice human animal sacrifice is being hidden by a game so i see art and movies and everything like as a a narrative against chaos against ooh, tin ice guys you know like it's tin fucking ice mm. and if we're going to allow drones and it's tin ice mm. we mm. can all go through it that's what i think i think you're right i do think it's life and death kind of get if if you get in the right space that that's a you know when maggie said all the irish are liars i was like she's right <laughs> That's a good adaptive mechanism. Yeah, you protect yourself. <laughs> yeah. yeah. Don't okay, let I still have three hands, so I'll take this gentleman first and four. Okay. One. Um, just in relation to actually Jim touched on this um, Netflix and the, the availability of movies. On. It's interesting, if anybody has Netflix or uses it, it's very easy to get US Netflix on it. You can mm. just change something on your internet and you get US Netflix. It's an original called Citadel that hasn't been released here yet, Carol Foy's one, which I've watched on the US Netflix and it's yet to be released here. And I think there's a major problem with distribution in terms of our I think we they come out, they're shown once, they make them out a year later. People don't know when they're going to come out. And it's a good film, it's, it's, it's well made, it's very decent, very watchable. But a lot of people have, will may well have seen it before it's even released this film. I think if I'm right Carmel uh, Snap is not really released on DVD. On DVD? Yeah. It's not released from what I It's want. not because there's still a possibility. I I've mean, never, I, I've never seen it. I've seen one, see it. I can't get on it. It's on Volta, it all right. It. But it's uh, hard to see. Oh. Between the clouds and the kind of this year. Yeah, just a few weeks ago, yeah. after four years. Yeah. I think it's. If we're going to get anybody interested in films, we have, they have to be available and they have to be able to very. A lot more formats and a lot more. Yeah. yeah. I went down to just because of the success of the card on DVD about oh. eight or nine years after yeah. it was released on VHS and then released on DVD. Uh, last year, and I think it's crazy. I think. Well, I suppose whose responsibility is that? You know, is it no, a cultural it's institute? Is it? Um, I think the question boards, where, where it should be something. Is I it a commercial enterprise? Yes. I keep telling you, people make things and don't distribute them. Yeah. They okay. just leave them there, and it's very hard, you know. But distribution is much more important, yeah. and and advertising than making them. Mm. In, in in just the world of commerce we're talking mm -hmm. about, right? Yeah. So just one last point for you. Um, I saw a film actually by Ivan Cabinet in Command, which released, mm. it's made in 2007, and it's a magnificent film, yeah. and it's never been seen. It's never yeah. What's it called? Tin Man. Tin Can Man. It's terrific. It's I mean, where it's, did you see it? I, I can't have the What if you just had a place, you know, where if tourists came, you could see any Irish movie? Yeah. Yeah. I mean, just well, it's any called the Irish movie. Film Institute and the archive. Yeah. You can you can actually see if you book in advance, you yeah. can come and see any 
Irish movie in the book. Can you see these ones like, snap? And, yes, you yeah. can. Um, and for, I don't think that's broad enough. I value it massively, but I do think it needs to be much more accessible. Yeah, I, I don't much think a lot more accessible. Like from, internet. From a researcher's point of view, which is what, what, yeah. what I yeah. do, it is, it's a, a brilliant resource, yeah. but it, it's, I, I suppose you're talking about something much more maybe com- commercial. Um, I Not even commercial, but democratic, to be honest. You know, okay. And then look, there's Ireland, and there's Dublin, and there's Temple Bar. Do you know what I mean? Let's, let's be just blunt about it. Mm. In terms of real access, and, and I, I live down in West Cork, and where I am, I can't get most people. I, I've, all I can access is through the internet, really. You know, I'm just, and if a film comes to the local cinema, and if it's Irish, it might get one screening. That's it. I think pressure has to be put to bear on, from an audience point of view, audiences are powerful as well. Like They can demand that their local multiplex takes in more films. My local multiplex goes in waves. And I think it's down to the email barrages I sent to them about their limited screening policies. And then from time to time, they will increase, um, say, you know, non-mainstream American blockbusters. So audiences mm. as well are important. To but look, at, just take a, a slight reverse for a sec. After In the Name of the Father, and maybe not good for me, I had to start previewing movies. So I had to start getting the audience response. And it's a totally different world. Mm-hmm. It's a totally, totally different world once you start concerned about communicating and what they give back, you know. And sometimes I go see Irish movies and I go, if they took that scene out, mm-hmm. it might have a chance. Do you know what I mean? Like, I wish we'd brought. Well, I mean, I think we should be bringing each other in. I'd love to have had you in the edit room. <laughs> Do you know no, what no, I mean? Like, need, but but if you it. show it to an... Look, I, I had this weird experience when I did uh, In America. For reasons best known to themselves, the studio decided that they would not release the movie right away. You know, like They said, we would bring it out. And th- my reward was they were bringing it out next year. I said, fuck off, and fought them, and got all the way up to next to Murdoch, and I had to give in. But... So they, my reward was they were going to release it in England. I said, don't release it in England. They were like, oh. so they got me to UAP, and UAP said, we're going to put the movie out in England. I said, if you take out the first scene, it has a small chance. Which film is this, sorry? In American. Okay, and what was in the first scene? The first scene is they come to a border, and the immigration guard finds out they have a dead child, and he lets okay. them in. Mm. It's an unbelievable scene. But if you're going to put an unbelievable scene in the movie, put it in first, because they've paid in and they're going to get past it, like King Lear dividing his land to the three daughters. But when that movie plays, and, and this is nothing to do with any connotations with religion, but there's a huge difference between the American and English audience in experience and Irish product. So they took all the most intelligent, and this is what I mean by people living in a dream. They took the most intelligent film reviewers to see, you know, the movie. And every one of them said the same thing, said from the unbelievable first scene on. Now, belief, religion, Coleridge, where he says the suspension of this belief is what it's about. So you have to suspend your belief system. So when you go to any experience that your own belief system is crashing with what's been, with somebody talking, you're going like, don't talk anymore. So in that movie, the minute they fucking see the car driving to New York, the English, like, intellectual goes, you don't drive to New York, you fly mm-hmm. from Ireland. So there, but, but the reason that that response has been produced is that the, the, the act of driving to New York is rejecting them. Mm-hmm. It is saying, we're not going to London, you're not implying us, we're not having to survive off your penny. And they fucking hate it. Because they're being rejected, and nobody takes rejection well. So every narrative opens, like, everybody talks about, you know, your 10 minutes, one image, 
the movie's over. Because every image is the DNA of the story. So don't, you know, sometimes you just, I don't know what that all means, but. <laughs> Well, we might take another question and uh, yeah, um, here. well, it's more of a, a consolation for Mark. Um, Mark, I, I think um, the uh, singing, songwriting, music thing is actually very much part of the same pool as as um, as filmmaking. We're probably all very dysfunctional, and uh, you know, uh, art house kind of has has a small percentage of the population will go and view art house movies and making the the crossover. To, to mainstream uh, involves compromises maybe that art house producers don't want to do. Songwriting, in Dublin, if you didn't live in Peru, you'd find actually there is a, a very vibrant um, open mic uh, thing where there's a lot of Irish music, original, new happening. But the punters are in listening to, uh, particularly the tourists, listening to, you know, the fields of Ath and Rye in the, in, in the pub next door, which is chock-a-block, you know, so you, do you mean pub music, though? I'm talking about pub music, yeah, but the open mic scene is, is actually where there's a lot of really, really solid stuff, uh, and, and, and there are a number of showcase nights, you know, so... Are they getting their opportunity, though, to produce records and get them out to the Irish pub? No! No, if they're doing it, they're doing it on the indie scene, and there's a lot of that out there as well. You can find that on the internet, but there is a lot of Irish stuff. Um, you know, like Damien Dempsey is absolutely fantastic. And I remember when I came to Dublin, Damien, um, not getting the listen, but he was playing every week um, in in um, the international in Malloy's or no, the, the international, yeah. Um, but you know, smaller ones and getting very demoralised. I mean, I'm delighted it's all happened for him. Um, I'm, I'm at 61, putting my first hour single out, um, uh, was in the studio yesterday and, uh, you know, I haven't, I haven't, again, it's down to, I, I don't have a, a, a bean to, to, um, to distribute it and I'm, I'm, I'm banking on, okay, you know, it's a single, I've got three albums, which I haven't distributed, but, you know, it's, it's, it is what it is, it's, 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 um, the, the, as, Jim said, you know, like we, we, we live on what we see on the telly and, 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 um, um, and things that have blown up and even if you go to the cinemas now you'll see massive cardboard cutouts and models of what's coming like next, next, the next superhero or whatever. Anyway, so not really a question, okay. just no, conservation, I keep making movies. I think it's amazing and I, I think, you know, uh, there is, I know what you mean about there's a whole uh, traditional culture there. Um, and I think that's really important to them. I, I'm, I just, I'm not sure if those traditional musicians are getting enough opportunity, you know, and I think they should. Uh, I just thought, I just think the film industry is getting opportunity at the moment. You know, Damien probably was lucky and he came, came along a good few years ago, but um, I think people back then were getting more opportunity. Okay, okay, we've uh, two questions at the back from this lady. Yeah. yeah. Um, well, Mark uh, uh, felt that there was a new wave and I was wondering what Carmen think about what uh, you will think that there will be a new wave for you then. You see, what will you do it's like kind of so the extended unknown. Like, really, yeah. how long can you stay in the unknown before something truly new can take shape? And it's, it's actually, it's not within your control. But what I suppose I was getting at is I'm seeing in kind of 15 down, age 15 down, they're, way, they're getting reflections of moving images of themselves at such a young age and they're wielding cameras at age one. They're actually filming at age one. So their way of looking at the world, the world is being framed. They're seeing abstracted representations of the world and they're making them. Now, if you've done something from a very young age, it's completely different to how you arrive at it as an adult, because their brains are only forming. So there's, an, I mean, literally their whole neural network is available to this activity, like there is available to be shaped by this activity. Whereas when I, you know, I, 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 I'm, I became old to filmmaking compared to these kids. They're making films in toddlerhood. Now, grow them up grow them up, what will they do? We don't know. We don't know. 
I think though, Carmen, are you talking about the evolution of technology? Because it's just what I what, what I mean with, like with the new wave is that um, a lot of the new waves that have happened, nearly all of them, you know, have come out of recession and have come out of difficult times. You've got this much, you have to do something. Yeah. You're going to do something really personal, and that's why I talked personally about Charlie yeah. Casanova. I don't think it's the best film ever made, but I think it was revolutionary in a way which was this is deeply personal this is political social and it's a it's it's an Irish film more than just the idea of an Irish film because it's it's come it's born you know it's yeah. it's, it's born out of something see I don't know I mean for instance for me Adam and Paul was a big moment and and I uh, think so it happened at the right height, height of the recession I mean of the boom the, the, and the height of the boom yeah. I mean, I don't know is the answer. The real, like, to answer your question, I don't know. And actually, I have to kind of um, be honest that the I don't know is actually a sure sign <laughs> that what, whatever it is is bigger than I can encompass at the moment or more strange than what I can encompass. Okay. Um, yep, this goes It's back. very interesting to hear you all um, talking about the process uh, and your your approach to things instead of you know most sort of publicity interviews where it's all about pushing the product and uh, you mentioned about audiences and communication and storytelling and uh, I'd just like to ask um, I spent a few years in New Zealand and I was interested to see in the Maori filmmaking community there they have a kind of different approach um, a filmmaker called Barry Barkley has an idea of talking in or talking out depending on whether you're speaking to an audience who your tribe or your audience or maybe in our case say for an American or an English market and I'm just wondering in terms of um, giving voice to groups or stories that might have been seen on screen before and um, when you're going about making stories or films do you take on board the sort of talking in talking out idea as well do you try and please every audience or, or very vague question but thank you no, it's a okay, great question. Thanks. Does anybody want to take that up? Um, I think, for me, it's as simple as this. I want the maximum amount of people to see the film. Um, and, uh, and whatever I can do to try and engage with the maximum amount of people. Um, I, and probably the kind of... I mean, you, I make films um, that I'd like to see myself, really. I'm interested in the antics of young people uh, and the trouble they get into. Um, um, and so I, I can only approach it like that, really. But uh, the wish is that everybody get to see it. You know, that's the wish. You know, I don't really want it to be for a select few. I don't want it to be a niche market, any of that kind of stuff. I want to get the most people to see the film. I, I think it's an incredible question, and I think, and I profoundly recognise it as the biggest question I ask myself in front of a project. And why it's the biggest question is because it's my proximity to the work. And I actually think the only thing you have as a director is your relationship to the piece, which then influences everyone else's relationship to the piece. It's a relationship. It's not you. The work isn't actually you, but you're, it's your intimate partner for the duration. And um, the talking in, talking out, like I saw, I think it, an Australian mm -hmm. film where it was made purely talking in. And it was profoundly different and exciting and it shocked me and I, I kind of, you know, had that tingling, nerve ending thing. But uh, I know that at the moment it's, it's exactly what's at stake when people talk about the second feature phenomenon. And very often what people say is, oh, now we want something um, more more commercial, broader, opened out. And they're really actually defining what you're getting at. The first one may be talked in, like between the canals, for instance, a talking, I'd call that a talking in. Not that it isn't, can't be watched and received and really excited and celebrated. I would call your friend Brendan met Judy a talking out film. I, I, I actually recognise the difference in those two films. And I thought that's what Jerry Stembridge did with About Adam, was he said, we can do talking out films and according to an Americanized model. It was definitely an Americanized model, that particular talking out, but it was a talking out. So, and actually in the talking out film, I've been analyzing popular films. Like I, when, the likes of The Guard now, for instance, is that a talking in or a talking out? 
there's a little bit of talking in. I didn't like the film, right? I didn't like it, okay. But I paid close attention to why the nation seemed to celebrate it. And when I looked at it, I said, I said what I saw going on in it was the film in a recession we displace our, dis our, our, our unease, and the unease was displaced onto political correctness. The whole film to me seemed to be about um, our anxiety about we'll open our mouth and put our foot in it by saying a racist thing, a homophobic thing. And the film was actually all about a guy who says all the most pugnacious, this, you know, odious things you could say, but has no shame about it. Because the scenes with his mother and the scenes with the prostitute who think he's great prove that his heart is in the right place. So therefore, the film was actually addressing a massive national anxiety around the last few years. The pressure has been on us to <coughs> behave a certain way, to take responsibility for what comes out of our mouths. And yet, I think I would say it was a pretty low common denominator instead of a high common denominator. That'd be my own opinion, but I, you know, respect, I respect, you know, the difference. But but I'd say. In terms of the talking in, talking out, it's it's probably the first question you'd ask about your relationship to the piece. I think we're running out of time. I'm terribly sorry. Um, the time has flown by and we've covered a huge range of fascinating subjects on, on film. Could I ask each of the filmmakers just to maybe say one thing? If we meet again in five years' time, Will we be talking about the same issues, or what would you like us to be talking about in terms of um, Irish film and where it will be? Very quickly. I don't want to put me on the spot, but just to, to round up. Juanita? I just hope there's uh, one, two, three, four, five other people here um, <laughs> that have a lot of uh, hopefully successful experience um, and new ideas and new thoughts to challenge us and keep us on our toes, I guess. Okay. Jim? Yeah, something the same. I don't know. Five years seems like short time. Yeah. Well, no. Um, I don't know. I, I mean, I find it inspiring to listen to all these people. So, just hope you do it again. And uh, it's interesting to me. I think kind of everybody is lonely. So when they they hear, you know, what their narratives or problems are, you kind of feel at one with the people, you know, you kind of, I think just everybody wants to be heard and, and that's difficult, you know, but yeah, just to kind of have a world where people can be heard instead of, you know, barriers. And okay. I just second that. Yeah, where people can be heard. And Actually, no to be seen, because when yeah. you said about that, about him needing to be seen, mm -hmm. Grace and Perry says, um, attention is low grade love. It'd be great if the grade of the love went up in the scene. Okay. Yeah. Kieran? Uh, well, I, I think uh, uh, what's really depressing uh, currently is uh, the lack of an audience for films that are made in Ireland. Um, and uh, I'm not sure if that's going to improve, to be honest. Um, what is surprising is that there's a huge appetite for television, Irish television. You know, I'm talking dramas, I'm talking comedies, and things that are have a zeitgeist about them. Like, well, Love Hate is a perfect mm. example. Um, it has gripped the nation, and uh, it's to a lesser exciting. extent, The Savage Eye mm. has a go. Um, mm and Irish Pictorial Weekly. You know, people like to see, uh, people like to watch this stuff and, and like to uh, see, you know, have a go at, uh, at, kick over the statues in a sense, you know, and prod and poke and, and make fun of and, and um, so there's, there's an audience there for that stuff, right? So um, more interesting stuff is coming out of television and actually more interesting stuff is coming about out of American television and Danish television and British television, then there is going on the, onto the movie screens. You know, I went to see, uh, I went to yeah. see um, what, Zero Dark Thirty, which is a fine film, mm -hmm. but I couldn't help sitting there thinking, like, well, first of all, I know what's going to happen at the end of this film, right? You know, they're going to get him and they're going to kill him, and that's that, right? But, but apart from that... A revenge know, movie, it's a nasty emotion. Mm. Well, yes, that's questionable, definitely. Um, but 
I think what, what was uh, interesting about watching the film was I couldn't help think, God, I'd much prefer to be home watching Homeland. There's more twists and turns, I don't know what's yeah. going to happen, and it's, more, it's, a better, it's just a better watch. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And that happens all the time with television, and less so with the cinema. So I think there's something to be learned about television, actually. Absolutely, and it's easy, almost easier to get that stuff, get viewing that stuff. Absolutely, as, as yes. And like, just, sorry, just another little point. Films, uh, good television, like, um, you know, some people may not think this is great television, but uh, something like House of Cards, for example, uh, the first, I've seen the first three episodes. The first three episodes of, the, of that series um, have been directed by feature film directors. Uh, David Fincher started it off, uh, James Foley then did one, and then Joel Schumacher did one. So, But Kieran, TV goes to talking heads. It goes to intimacy. It goes to those stories that normally independent film used to tell. And the rest is going to the train coming in the station. You know, the, the scary visual image that... You know, and they're making blow up, and they're making that, mm. and there seems to be nothing in between. Yeah, no, it's like what you said—the death of independent American cinema as well. Mm. Okay, and Mark. Uh, well, I met Morgan Sullivan the other day out in his office in his <coughs> what uh, office in uh, Ardmore, and uh, over the whole conversation, he just said one thing just stuck with me, and it was you have to rent it there. Uh, reinvent the wheel mark that's what he said to me and i just thought like it, the thing that i'd like to see the most in five years is the evolution of cinema and because i feel like it's still in its in well maybe it's a teenager and i feel tv is a baby like even britain shows like the sopranos the wire i feel like there's a lot of evolution to still happen in tv and, and for them to develop and um, so I, and I think, yeah, I, I agree with you, with you Karen, as well, but about the distribution model, I think a lot, a lot needs to happen. I think the film board are doing a, a great job, but mm -hmm. I just hope that they continue to take risks and to support, you know, both, both of those. Um, but the distribution model is difficult because the advantage of being from Ireland is that if, if a, a film is a hit, it can go to American because it's in the English language, but then the disadvantage is, um, is that uh, we're competing with the mainstream films in the Hollywood you know, in the multiplexes. But uh, no, the biggest wish is that, you know, it evolves and people take risks and Irish film becomes something special in, in five years. Okay. Well, thank you very much to our panels. Um, I think we're, we're out of time. We'll give you the last, the last uh, word. It's a historic week to have this conference because this was the week when the three companies manufacturing film cameras for the studios said it's all over, we won't be making them any more. Okay. They, 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 they don't, you mean 35 mil? Yeah, 35 mil, they're not being you made know, anymore. Do you know when, I just asked the audience this, and I'd like to know what you think. When a film is projected, and it's 24 frames a second, how much dark that we don't see is in there? Like, in other words, <laughs> there's a little bit between each frame. I always thought, and I could be wrong, that that's a hypnotic experience. It's like a contemplative darkness that you don't see. Just, just, and your head goes into that darkness when you're in the audience. You don't have that with digital. No. You have head-on presentation, no trump, uh, no fooling the eye, no lying. It is different. It's different. It's yeah. not lying. Yeah. Yeah. And lying is now, I've just come out of this thinking that lying is the best adaptive mechanism. <laughs> Do you know what I mean? That like... But what about the blink? The <laughs> blink? Like in our human vision, mm. we always blink. So we, yeah. we blink and even during the digital. Digital doesn't let us do that. No, but we still blink in front of it. So we're <laughs> we're inserting darkness. The darkness. Yeah, I'd say the rate of blinking could well increase. <laughs> 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 they used to call an old person so blinking. <laughs> we call it the, the Jim Sheridan blink. <laughs> But I think we have to wrap it up. Unfortunately, we may take our discussions down to the coffee shop or the bar. Um, I think if I go away with anything from today's session, it's that storytelling is what it's about. 
and there's an audience out there and if getting those two together we would be sitting here in five years, ten years, twenty years time there'll still be a vibrant Irish Senate. And I just have to say that if the people waited a little bit too long I have to blame Damien Dempsey. Okay. <laughs> okay, because I heard him singing last night amazingly. Anyway. Okay, so a big round of applause for our panel.